Hey everybody, it's Dr. Susie Harris from Cedarwood Natural Health Center. I'm here today in Highgate, Vermont with Matt Schwanier from the Schwanier Family Farm. It's an organic dairy farm and I'll let him tell you more about all the cool things that are here. I'm sure you know if you've been around me much that I'm a big fan of nutrition and um, I'm on this quest to try to show people what's behind the scenes on some of these farms. Like what does it take to have a farm like this and have it uh, run well and have healthy livestock and nutritious food and keep the farmers healthy as well. Um, another part of my inspiration is in my practice I'm seeing more chronic health issues popping up in younger people as well as our you know middle of the road and older folks are starting to have kind of layers of health issues and um, from what I know and the research I read five percent of illness comes from your genetics the other 95 is really from environmental factors. So the more we can offer clean food and clean water, of course, I'm going to say access to functional health care. Um, so thank you so much, Matt, for having this here. It's a lot of time out of your day, and um, I really appreciate it. I've known your family for about 15 years. Yeah, long time. Taking care of you guys and um, being in your life. Um, so I wonder, maybe we start off with you could tell a little bit of history about your farm and and get people familiar with that. Yeah, well, we're excited to have you up and we're excited that we get to share this with everyone else. Um, and welcome everyone who's, who's watching. Um, we're on the Schoenier Family Farm in, in Highgate, Vermont. Uh, we're just a little bit south of Canada. We're a fourth generation dairy farm. Um, my grandparents moved over from Canada uh, in the early 1900s and uh, bounced around uh, farm to farm until they landed on this one when my grandfather was uh, in his mid-teenage years. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, my grandfather was one of uh, 11 siblings. And, you know, they all kind of spread out as they got older. But uh, at the age of uh, 16, he, he started managing this farm. Wow, this one. This one, this one that we're on. All right. And, you know, each generation is, um, has learned a lot. You know, it started with my great-grandfather when he immigrated over, uh, then my grandfather, then my dad, now me. Um, and we've all brought something totally new to the table. Hmm. My great-grandfather, and when they moved here, they were really good at keeping cows a long time. Mm. They milked cows for, for 10, 15 years. They were healthy, but they didn't make a lot of milk. Hmm. Um, my grandfather came in around like when, when fertilizers and corn and monocrops started coming in, a lot of equipment, and my grandfather learned how to make, make a lot of milk, but the cows didn't last as long. Hmm. Uh, and then when my dad came to take over the farm in, um, in the early 2000s, uh, he wasn't seeing the financial stability that, that my grandfather had in his day. So he started looking at other opportunities and uh, organic uh, dairy farming was, was a big opportunity that was coming into the area. Organic Valley was actively recruiting uh, dairy farms. And uh, you know we had, we had an option between a few different organic dairy cooperatives. And we had a group of local farmers approach my dad and say, hey, like, why don't you come to one of our meetings and um, see how you like it. But they said, you're an organic valley farmer. So my dad went and typically dairy meetings, especially around that time when prices were fluctuating a lot, they weren't necessarily a very fun place to be. There were um, a lot, there's a lot of emotion going around because, you know, a lot of people's livelihoods were on the line with, with poor milk prices. So the, the organic valley meetings were very supportive. Everyone was like, we're all in this together. Organic Valley is a farmer owned cooperative. So okay. the farmers, like we had to buy into Organic Valley. So we like, when they say farmer owned, it's actually owned by the farmers. Okay, so it's truly cooperative. It's, it's a true cooperative. There's a farmer board of directors. There's a farmer, um, there's farmer executive committees to, to guide the board of directors. Okay. And this was way different than, than a lot of our experience in the past. Meaning the farmers got to keep their ownership and 
the histories of their farms intact. We got a say. We got a say in what happened with our milk and how the business was run. Got you. Okay. And that was, you know, that's not common. Got and it. after that first meeting, the the family atmosphere, um, the the importance of the farmer in the cooperative. Uh, my dad was like, "Hey, like this is." I was young, so I wasn't really involved at that point. Yeah. Um, but. I'm glad my dad went with Organic Valley because they've treated us very well awesome. um, through the highs and lows. They've they've truly worked really hard for the farm. What year was that? Would you say we transitioned? We shipped our first load of of organic milk to Organic Valley in uh, 2005. Okay. But it was a three year transition. Got and it. So it took us three years to transition the land and the animals from conventional to organic. So we had to manage organic for three years before we got paid organic. Prices. Okay, because you're not truly organic till your conventional farm has been offline for three years. Right, right. We had to, you know, the, the land had to have time to heal. The animals had to have time to get every, all the inorganic stuff out of their system. Mm -hmm. And also that it's, it's in place so people aren't just like constantly swapping back and forth between organic and conventional depending on mm -hmm. on what the prices are doing. Oh, right. That makes you can't, sense. You can't so he just keeps switching back and forth like nice. you've got like once you're organic like you can't really switch back to conventional what was that like so you've got the conventional ways that keep your animals safe and healthy mm -hmm. and all that stuff and then you're taking all those tools away to do it differently yeah it was scary i mean a lot of it's it's a scary transition because you're going from something that you know works like maybe not as well as you'd like but like if an animal gets sick, you know how to treat her. Yeah. Um, you know that your crops are going to be okay because you have the chemicals in your toolbox to, you know, address whatever issues come up. Like knocking back weeds or Knocking back weeds, any insects or, or diseases that come around. Mm -hmm. you, there are solutions. Uh, and with organic, it was a totally different mindset. But we were lucky we were paired up with a really good mentor who's been organic for a long time. And he, he told my dad, like, cause my, you know, your first thoughts are what's the organic replacement for this like X conventional product. Right. Like, what's, what's my antibiotic here? Right. What's my antibiotic? What's my herbicide? Like how, how are my cows not going to die? Cause everyone, all the neighbors, like the, the vet, like they're all saying like your cows are going to die. Whoa. Like, okay. That's not scary. No, it was, it was, <laughs> it was very scary. And there was a learning curve, but Mm. the wise words of our mentor was that like the soil knows what to do oh like, cool he's like relax you just got to relax he said trust that if you focus on soil health and plant like plant health and animal health will follow mm -hmm. so that's exactly what we started doing we started you know treating our soil like we, we, trying to reduce things like compaction on our soil by not running over it so many times with our equipment um using more organic based um soil amendments like uh manure we have a lot of manure on the farm yeah um organic min rock based minerals trying to improve the diversity species diversity mm -hmm. and planting more nutrient dense crops and also changing our cows diets away from high amounts of grains to more forages like like grasses and legumes and forbs. I'm not sure if this is the right time to ask this question, but I wonder like when you're switching the diet of the cows over mm -hmm. more to the legumes and the grass, is there a change in the nutritional value of the milk? I'm sure. I know Organic Valley did a study a long time ago comparing uh, more the fatty acids, the, looking specifically at the fatty acids, right. um, comparing um, conventional cows, conventionally fed cows on like a high grain diet mm -hmm. to cows, like organic cows, which we have, a, we can't feed more than a certain amount of, of grain to the cows, like we're capped. So they're, they have to be forage based. Got it. And then there's the 100% grass fed cows. Mm -hmm. And there are significant increases in the proportion of omega-3 to omega-6 as you went to each new level. Yeah. Highest being the grass-fed. Mm, of the omega-3. Of, of the omega-3. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the lowest being uh, omega-3s being uh, conventional dairy. Understood. That being said, conventional dairy is still like a five, five to one. Like it's not, 
it's not like you're you're like drinking vegetable oil like sure. when you're when you're drinking con conventional dairy I but get you. um it goes from like five to one conventionally to one to one mm -hmm. um grass-fed mm -hmm. and okay. like two two and a half to one gotcha uh, um organic regular organic uh, so there's definitely differences, but regardless of, of those, like we've seen just seeing our cows going from conventional to 100% grass fed where we are now, mm -hmm. um, we've seen huge improvements in their health. Okay. Where we used to have way back when we first started a $6,000 a year vet bill, um, which I don't, I don't even know what that would be now with inflation, but now like it's hardly anything we have okay we have our vet our herd checks our checkups once a month okay um where he just comes and makes like checks on the pregnant cows um checks on the calves mm -hmm. um and just but it's very basic very quick very few animals do we ever have to call a vet um to come and treat because they're sick mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. i really loved what you said about when you're planting nutrient dense grasses and and the diversity of the plants it's really about the soil knows what to do the soil knows what to do and it's if we can get out if we can stop degrading the soil the soil really left to its own devices heal itself right we just have to know what it needs and what we shouldn't be doing to it yeah i mean that's so in alignment with my healthcare practice as mm -hmm. you probably know like for me, um, in the practice, we're always trying to get people to let the body heal itself. The work that we do at Cedarwood is really about lifting the burden off the body. You know, too much sugar, too many toxins, not enough sleep, not enough water. Mm -hmm. Taking those burdens off your body, the body knows how to heal. Yeah. You're kind of saying the same thing about the soil. Take the burdens off the soil of too much compaction and... Uh, the other things that might create stress on the soil and the soil just fixes itself. Right. Do you do other things though? Do you add things to the soil when you're, do you like measure where the soil's at and make adjustments and stuff? Yeah, like we're, a lot of what we do is, you know, by farming, like we can reduce the stress as much as we can, but we still are stressing the soil. Mm -hmm. It's like to harvest winter forage for the cows to eat when there's when there's no pasture, we do have to go on there with equipment and, and take off grass. So like we do have to add in add nutrients back, so like like manure. Okay. Um, but the things we try to all the management activities we do are we try to minimize our impact mm -hmm. and maximize like maximize the benefit i guess i love it so and when, when we're looking at the health of a field you know we we start we start with the soil health and you know like and it's very much the same with as well like people need you know we start like first thing healthy soil needs is air right okay. like what's if you go without air like you're not going to live for very long and neither will the life in the soil okay so the biggest thing um that gets air to the soil is compaction Okay. So all of our equipment is set up. Like, although they're still tractors, we try to put the biggest tires on that we can. We try to have the smallest equipment that we can while still getting the job done. Okay. Um, so we'll, less pushing down on the soil. Less pushing down. Okay. We're lucky that we live where it freezes hard every winter and the frost can actually break up the soil a lot mm -hmm. just from the freezing and thawing. Mm -hmm. um, but then we can also um, run equipment that can actually, you know, re release some of that compaction mm -hmm. and they're like subsoilers. It's a special type of plow that will, you know, it makes a very minimal disturbance on the, on the top, mm -hmm. but it has like these wings underneath where as you, as you pull it through, it just gently lifts on the soil, like okay. eight inches or 10 inches of soil. And that will help to move the soil enough to re to relieve some of that compaction bring in some of the air cool and, but also just keeping plant healthy plants in the soil will relieve compaction now is that getting into the whole no-till thing yeah i mean i mean the more tilling soil will definitely it breaks up the structures that are in place that hold soil together but also porous okay so like like roots 
plants will secrete sugars and bacteria will secrete different glues and fungus will re secrete different glues. And, and what they do is they, they form these like small clumps of soil that it, they have space between them. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, when you see healthy soil, it's very crumbly. Okay. Like, like stable, crum like, uh, how, how do I say it? Um, they're called soil aggregates is, is what they are. Okay. But you don't want to have like a solid brick of soil. Yeah. And that's what happens if you, if your soil doesn't have enough life in it, doesn't have, you know, plants living on top of it. You're always driving over it. Like you take a shovel and you can, you'll take like a brick mm -hmm. that'll just turn to dust. Okay. Once you, once you crush it. We're going to take a walk around your farm oh, yeah. in a second. Well, sort of a second. Um, so you can show us some of what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, again, part of what had me want to come and talk with you is um, I have this fairy tale dream that we're going to keep seeing more of our farms turning to uh, this uh, health focused for the for the farmers, for the animals, for the mm -hmm. soil. You know, everyone's talking about environment and things like that. Um, what do you have to say about environmental impact of of, of your type of farming? Yeah, well, I think um, part of being organic and I think therefore regenerative um, is a lot of what we do is, is for the benefit of the environment. Okay. Our practices are, are designed so that like we're not releasing toxins into the environment. We're not exposing the fa our families and the, and the consumers to potentially harmful substances. Mm-hmm. Is runoff a thing? Like, are you able to keep runoff a little bit less of an issue for water? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, like I said, you know, there's a lot of benefits to keeping plants, living plants on the, on the ground and keeping the ground covered. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is, you know, water is, is kind of stopped as it, as it flows over the ground and it, it soaks in versus running off. I see. And, and nutrients aren't a problem in, in, on the farm until they go into the water waterways. Okay, I see. So and and it's a it's a loss for the farmer. Do you mean nutrients that you've put in the soil? Right, or even just soil itself. Okay. A lot of runoff is heavy in toxins because they're stuck to the soil particles that are just kind of like running off. Okay. So if you have, if, let's say you you have like a this let's pick on an open cornfield. Okay. You know there's you know there's a lot of 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 open soil exposed on a, on a cornfield mm -hmm. you get a heavy rainstorm and there's not a lot of plant life to slow that water down mm -hmm. and you get a lot of surface runoff mm. and that with that surface runoff it takes a lot of soil and a lot of nutrients and then so you're slowly losing all that topsoil you have in your field mm -hmm. uh, but you're also losing a lot of nutrients so like those are nutrients that you then have to purchase right right so okay. it's, it's not good for the farmer or or the environment when when you have uh, runoff like that okay and I did have someone tell me, I don't know how true this is, that there's a, with this style of farming, there's sequestration of CO2. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yeah, and it's definitely something I want to talk about when we, when we go out to the pasture. Okay, so you'll show us some cool things. Yeah, well, I'll show you some cool things. But I guess to, to sum it up, like, like plants, living plants, like that's what, that, they're big CO2 vacuums. Mm -hmm. Photosynthesis is taking sunlight and water and co2 and turning it into sugars and and water and well, i guess i forgot the exact conversion but like yeah it it, it turns co2 into sugars and, and okay. plant material okay so they're they're pulling all that co2 out of the air using just sunlight really and then they're building um they're building plant material with it they're pumping a good proportion of those sugars into the soil to feed the microbes mm -hmm. and also like building organic matter it's like living plants like actually grow soil life as well got you and the whole time that that whole cycle especially if you're grazing or or managing that plant material well mm -hmm. like every time you you cut that grass or it's grazed um it actually pumps a lot of carbon into the ground for long-term storage. Got it. And so as you do that, like grass grows, it gets grazed or, or clipped, and then it sloughs off root material 
and that goes into building organic matter into the soil, feeding so, soil microbes, um, getting turned into long-term carbon storage. Yep. Okay. So I know we have a lot of farmers here in Vermont, mm -hmm. and um, I think if I've got it correct, there's been quite a bit of policy and organizational supports put in place to help farmers that want to have access to having an organic farm. Is that, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, Vermont is an, if you want to farm in general, Vermont is an awesome place. And if you want to farm organically, like we have so many resources out there awesome, uh, to support people in their transition in running their organic farm. No for Vermont is the organization is the Northeast Organic Farmers Association. Okay. Um, and they're, they're, they're one of our biggest organic supports out there and they have everything from, you know, policy support where we have, we have um, staff working in the state house fighting for, you know, policies that help organic farmers, that help uh, consumers who are looking for access to nutritious food. Yep. Um, and even um, disaster relief for farmers. Okay. Because a lot of farms, uh, organic or conventional, have been impacted a lot by the by either flooding or droughts. Sure. That have been hitting the state within the past few years. Education is is something that organic farms can never get enough of. Like it, there's so many resources that NOFA, but also you know groups like um, the University of Vermont Extension, okay, or the Vermont Grass Farmers Association, or um, I'm gonna forget some if I try to list is them all. Rural Vermont. Rural Vermont okay. is, an, is another awesome policy policy support. Okay. And there, it's all really to help for one like allow us to do a better job mm -hmm. doing what we want to do, but also like giving us like access to opportunities. Um, I just enrolled in uh, the Farm Viability Program, which is its whole other entity, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a program that gives access to young starting farmers or even established farmers, uh, access to technical support, to grants, business, um, business planning, uh, really anything that you think that could help your farm okay and like there's just so much so many groups and so many organizations just trying to do their best to help the farm and even even groups governmental governmental groups like the nrcs which is the natural resource conservation service okay um or our local um watershed conservation districts mm -hmm. are you know they're out here um, planting trees on our riverbanks wow. um, to help stop erosion and to stabilize the riverbanks. Awesome. Or a lot of organized uh, support. So much. And like our, even some of our, um, our cattle lanes and, and rotational grazing infrastructure, like our fences and our water lines and our cattle lanes um, were all cost shared by government programs to help us, you know, with a startup cost to, to get going. Cool. So yeah, we're very lucky. Like Vermont is an awesome place for small farms, especially. Okay. Just to, uh, you know, and even the culture, the, cult, the culture in Vermont is very supportive yeah. towards small farms. I've heard you a couple times when you've come in talking about the energy of the young farmers coming in and there's yeah. a lot of excitement on some of the new developments and the level of support that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. What about the community? Is there anything that the community can be doing to support uh, farmers in this way because everyone's really kind of getting into nutrient dense foods and yeah. trying to go organic. Um, so to keep you being able to provide that for folks in the community. I, I, I would say if the community wants to help, you know, get out onto your local, local farm, your, your local veggie farm, your local beef farm, dairy farm, um, find a farmer that you trust and that you like how they manage and then and then buy their stuff yeah okay like farm there's nothing more rewarding for a farmer for one to be able to talk about you know why they do things than have someone be like i love that like i want to buy your food awesome and yeah. i think that's for one that's like huge moral support mm -hmm. um, but it's also like the, it's what keeps us going like we need we need people we, we produce food we need people to buy our food got it from the farm or from organic the farm, valley or anyone i mean yeah, like we specifically sell milk to Organic Valley. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, like going out and buying some Organic Valley butter or, or your gallon of Organic Valley milk. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, it could be, you know, stopping in at your neighbor who, who sells beef on the side. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's so much, once you know where to look, like there's so many farms around selling to their community. Yeah. You just need to know where to look and Granted, it's a little, it's not as convenient as, as getting all your groceries at like the nearest supermarket, mm -hmm. um, but it'll definitely make a bigger difference in, in the landscape of, of Vermont. Awesome. I love that. Well, thank you so much. I think we should have some fun, uh, take off and go let you show us a little bit around the farm, how you move cows from a, a grass that's been all eaten down and you want to move them and whatever else you want to show us. Cool. All right, cool. All right.